Any closer? All right, we got the rolling signal and everything. So um, I'm here to interview, uh, introduce uh, Alanka. Uh, she's a wonderful person. She spoke at ShmooCon, we were trying to figure it out, maybe two, three, uh, so ten, uh, 10 years ago. Well, ShmooCon two or three, so it would have been, you know, 10-ish years ago. And um, she's one of the most passionate people about her subject matter that I've ever met in my life. She, she loves what she does. She loves these kind of presentations, these kind of puzzles. She wrote a, a wonderful book um, that uh, I assume you can still find, at least on Amazon and things like that. In the bargain bin, but <laughs> it's it's uh, it's a fantastic book of pu puzzles in open places and things of that nature. So uh, we're really happy to have Alanka back this year. I'm very happy to see you again. It's been a long time. So uh, without further ado, uh, Alanka. Yep. Yep. So yeah, I'm thrilled to be back. Uh, I have great memories of ShmooCon, and now I'm actually living in the Washington, D.C. area, so I may be able to help out with ShmooCon. Also, um, about the picture thing, take pictures, knock yourself out. I'm here. If I'm drinking, I'm not drinking. Feel free to take pics. Uh, so um, uh, yeah, I moved to D.C. about a year ago, and um, I uh, uh, wanted to go to Arlington and go see the gravesite of some of my idols, William and Elizabeth Friedman. Uh, they are uh, well known in the crypto community, especially in the NSA. Uh, and William Friedman wrote many of the textbooks used by uh, NSA employees. He was there at the founding, and Elizabeth uh, was actually the one who taught him about cryptography. So um, I hope you can, you can see it. Well, let me uh, talk just briefly uh, about them. Uh, so uh, born uh, 1891, 1892, they met at this bizarre think tank called Riverbank Laboratories. How many people here have heard of Riverbank Laboratories? Yeah, really obscure. Uh, in Chicago, there was this uh, millionaire named uh, George Fabian who called himself Colonel George Fabian, and he set up a private research lab to research kind of anything that caught his fancy. Uh, one of those things was uh, the effect of moonlight on plant growth, so he hired a geneticist named William Friedman. Another is that he wanted to prove that Sir Francis Bacon had really been the one that wrote the works of William Shakespeare. Uh, so he had some uh, English majors there that were working on that. And what the, one of the people he hired there was a woman named Elizabeth Smith. Now the, the shape of Riverbank Labs even uh, confirmed some of George Fabian's eccentricity. He brought in some architects and on a table he set up a bunch of cigar boxes and he said, make the building look like that. And they made the building look like that. So uh, romance uh, at Riverbank, uh, William Friedman, the geneticist, uh, who was also a photographer, accompanied Elizabeth uh, and some of the other people on the team to take pictures of some manuscripts and also because he wanted to hang out with the, the young Elizabeth Smith. And uh, he courted her and they met. Uh, she taught him about cryptography and some of the things they were looking for in the works of William Shakespeare. And they got married May 21st, 1970, 1917. So exactly 100 years ago, uh, just coincidentally, 100 years uh, you know, that's the year that I moved to Washington, D.C. So also something happened in 1917. United States entered World War I. So there wasn't really a good crypto uh, team at the time. So Colonel George Fabian volunteered the use of his uh, group, his Shakespearean group, that had been looking for codes in the, in the works of William Shakespeare. And he volunteered them to the United States. And so... Elizabeth and William, now a young married couple, created the curriculum for the first group of World War I cryptographers. And they did something kind of fun, which was in the picture of the graduating class, you know, these big long pictures, they had some of the people facing forward and some to the side. And it was, they hid a code inside the picture of the graduating class. And this was using something called a Baconian cipher, which had been invented in the 17th century, uh, also called a biliteral cipher. So if you think of it in terms of ones and zeros, say someone who's facing forward is a one, and someone who's facing forward is a zero, or opposite, someone who's facing forward is a zero, someone who's facing uh, to the side is a one. 
And if you do that, and you split things up, in this case, into groups of five, you could do groups of anything, but traditionally it's groups of five. And so, if, say, if you have five forwards or five A's, that would be the letter A, and then four A's and a B would be the letter B, and so A, A, B, A would be a C, and, and onward going all the way through them. So that picture was very important to the Freedmans. And if uh, you look at, Fried this is the, the couple, Elizabeth and William, in 1957, when uh, they were doing a, a book tour and having pictures. And if you look at his desk, uh, in the glass of his de under the glass, you can see that long picture from the World War I cryptographers. So just very briefly, uh, William Friedman today is known as the father of American cryptology. He went on, he wrote about cryptography, he wrote several, several articles, he wrote the book and the training manuals for what today is known as the National Security Agency. If you've heard the term cryptanalysis, he's the one that made the term. If you're into crypto and you've heard the term index of coincidence, he's the one that came up with the term. So, so very, very important to cryptography. Uh, cracked many codes. Most famously, is, is, uh, he led the team for cracking the Japanese cipher that was known as purple. Uh, and just a, a bit of trivia for anyone that, that's ever been curious, why is that Japanese cipher called purple? It's because the information about it was kept in purple binders. So that's why they called it purple. Um, Elizabeth, not shabby, uh, she's considered America's first great female cryptanalyst. And remember, she's the one that taught him about cryptography. And she went on to an amazing career. She cracked the codes of drug smugglers, of uh, World War spies, of Nazis. This is a, a picture of her in the paper, 1937, the evening star of Washington, D.C. And um, she, uh, in, in 1957, she and her husband decided together and they wrote a book about that idea about whether or not Sir Francis Bacon had really uh, hidden codes in the works of William Shakespeare and had written uh, all those works. And they just debunked it from top to bottom and left to right. Uh, so if you ever get in an argument with someone about whether Bacon wrote Shakespeare's works, pick up this book. And it's also written in a very humorous fashion. They actually hid a code. So William and Elizabeth hid a code in their book about whether or not Francis Bacon wrote the works of William Shakespeare. So if you go and you look at page 257, I hope you can see this at the very bottom there, there's a paragraph with a line in italics. Okay, so you can see the italics. And again, I hope you can see it on these slides. Some of, if you look at the italics, some of the letters are bolded, they're a slightly different font, and some are not. For example, if you, work, if you look at the word limitation, you may see that the M is a little bit darker. Or if you look at the two T's in the word limitation, you'll see that one T is slightly different from the other T. So if you take all of those, and again, sort of like that, that graduating class picture where some look forward and some look to the side, but here at this point, let's say if you take those letters and you say the bolded ones are Bs and the unbolded ones are As, and again, break them into groups of five, so A, B, A, 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 and, and so forward, and it spells out a message. And the message is, I did not write the plays. <laughs> F. Bacon. <laughs> so um, William passed away in 1969. And Elizabeth designed his tombstone. Also, anyone who thinks that's a typo on the slide, that is the way Elizabeth was spelled. Uh, her mother did, never wanted her to be called Eliza, so deliberately changed the spelling of Elizabeth. So uh, Elizabeth, she, she designed the tombstone. She had a pair of cross flags. That was William's regiment. Uh, and then his name, uh, his date's a space for her own name. And then the words, knowledge is power. Now, knowledge is power was the message that that original World War I uh, graduating class picture, all the forwards and to the sides, spelled out the message, knowledge is power. So it, it, it fits. So my, a little bit about my own connection here. So I arrived in Washington, D.C. Woo, I, I get to help out with Shmukan now. And... Uh, <laughs> 
Um, and because I'm living here now, I get to really dig in and, and do some sightseeing. And so I wanted to go see Arlington Cemetery. I wanted to see the tombstone of William and Elizabeth Friedman. Arlington Cemetery, many of you may know, some may not. It's just south of Washington, D.C., on the Virginia side. It was founded during the Civil War, and it has over 400,000 graves. And William Friedman, uh, both, of, both William and Elizabeth are buried there. And if you want to go, and I'm happy to put together a tour on Sunday afternoon if anybody wants to go down there. Um, if you take the tour bus and you get off at the Coast Guard Memorial and then go all the way down the hill to the fence. So I walked all the way down the hill, and you can see that tombstone third from the left there is the tombstone of William and Elizabeth Friedman. And when I first got there, I was thinking, okay, there has to be a code on the tombstone. There just has to be. Um, but I didn't see anything off the top of my head. Knowledge is power. Okay, yeah, that, that ties in. And then later that evening, I was talking with some folks, and we looked into it a little deeper and noticed, hey, knowledge is power. Those letters are in slightly different fonts. And um, if uh, some of them are what's uh, used with you would call a serif font. So if you've heard of like sans serif and serif. So again, I'm not sure if you can see here, but the K has serifs on it. The N does not. Uh, an easy way to see it is if you look at the E in the word power, which has serifs, and look at the E at the end of the word knowledge, which does not have serifs. So again, put these into groups, groups of five, and it came out to the letters WFF, which was William F. Friedman. So it was just kind of a nice little cipher that Elizabeth put in there. And, and codes were just everywhere in their lives. They even had Christmas invitations and ciphers. So it was just very touching that, this, uh, that they also did the tombstone and cipher. So when they weren't, this is kind of just a last little thing, when they were not working on ciphers or uh, military ciphers. They were also working on famous historical ciphers, such as the Voynich Manuscript, which some of you may have heard of. It's, it's a several hundred years, it's, it, I think it's going on 500 years old, historical manuscript in a script that we cannot read with an alphabet that does, is not like anything else that we've ever found. So this is also a manuscript that, that I'm working on as well. So just kind of these, these connections. So if you would like to learn more about Elizabeth or William, there are actually two new biographies of Elizabeth that just came out last year. Uh, one written by a journalist, Jason Fagon, and the other written by one of her great nephews, uh, G. Stuart Smith. So that's A Life in Code. Uh, there's been one biography about uh, uh, William Friedman called The Man Who Broke Purple. Uh, and if you just want to learn about codes and ciphers, uh, the top book I recommend is The Code Book by Simon Singh. And, and David Kahn has just written the, the gold standard about codes and cryptographers, and that is The Code Breakers. Um, so um, I think I have time for a couple questions, if there's any questions. Nope. Wait, yes. I'm sorry? Which of the biographies do I recommend? I, I recommend them both. Uh, but uh, I think the one written by Jason is probably a little better research. Jason Fagoni. Okay. Have, you tried your hand Have I tried my hand at the Voynich manuscript? Oh, yes. Um, uh, the cipher that I really work on is Kryptos, the, the sculpture at the center of CIA headquarters. Um, but it's and, and I have a website on the world's most famous unsolved codes at adilanka.com. Uh, but uh, Vo you can't work on unsolved codes without trying your hand at the Voynich manuscript. And people ask me, you know, do you think it's a hoax? Do you think it was a, a really cipher? Was it just written by someone who was schizophrenic? Um, and uh, and my answer changes every day. Uh, it's it's. Uh, yeah, you could you could pick any one of those answers, and and it would be true because you could find all these things that say, oh yeah, that's true, until you get, hmm, maybe it's not true, <laughs> and then go on to one of the other answers. So probably the answer I think is uh, uh, that I believe in most often is that it was written as a uh, as a hoax, 
as a way of selling um, herbal ointments because it was written at a time about 100 years after the Great Plague. So people were very interested in medicinal ointments and the price of the ointment would increase according to the rarity of the herbs that were in the ointment. So if somebody made this elaborate manuscript that had these herbs that no one had ever heard of, like, ah, oh, very difficult to get, very expensive. Um, it might have also been written as a hoax for the Emperor Rudolph II. Anyway, I can give a whole talk about <laughs> Voynich manuscript. But yes, I've, I've tried it. Hey there. How do I what? Oh, so seraphim and sans serif. So sans is French. Sans serif. Oh, right. Um, it's, it's a very good question. The, in this case, we only have two O's, so we don't have anything to compare against. So in this case, we know that they are a serif because the other O's would have been a little bit wider. Uh, it's just difficult to see in, in this picture. But we know that this is the correct answer because Jason Fagom, while he was doing research in the Friedman Papers, which was at the Marshall Library in, in Virginia, um, he found a little piece of paper, almost like a post-it, that had been written uh, by Elizabeth to our Clark, Ronald Clark, uh, the biography of, who was the biographer of William Friedman, and it said uh, W slash F slash F, on Arlington uh, Monument for R. Clark, 1977. He never actually used that information in his biography, but it does confirm what the plain text is. Yeah. Cryptos, I'm one of my favorite topics. <laughs> okay. Uh, so again, I'm happy to come back to Shmukan a, another year and maybe uh, give an updated version. Cryptos, a sculpture in the center of CIA, head, CIA headquarters, has four ciphers on it. Three have been so solved, the fourth has not been solved, it's one of the most famous unsolved codes in the world. Uh, it's been around for about 20 years. The artist has given hints about that fourth part, so we, we know about 10% of the plain text. Uh, based on his hints, but we still don't know what the rest of it says. The plain text we know is uh, in the center of it, we have the words Berlin and clock. Uh, now, whether it's real plain text or whether he's pulling our chain, we don't know, uh, but we have uh, many people working on it, and anyone who's interested is, is welcome to join our, our Yahoo group where we're continuing to work on it. Am I missing any? Oh, in the back, yes. What? Any credence to the Voynich manuscript just being a bunch of? That it's written in Latin, the plain text might be Latin? Okay, yeah, okay, like, okay, shorthand or acronyms or, you know, doctors who write in ways that no one can understand. Like, for example, the way that the Amberson is really a ligature for its Yeah, it's possible. Yeah. It's possible. Anything's possible. We have people coming up uh, with ideas about the Voynich uh, pretty much. You know, every couple months or so, there's a, a website in England called cyphermysteries.com by Nick Pelling, uh, and, and he collects a lot of these, so that's a good place to go. Okay, I think I'm about out of time. All right, so if you have a takeaway from this, um, it's if you learn something, don't just take it at face value in the book that you're reading. Maybe go and look at it yourself figure it out yourself and you might learn something new that no one else ever has. Thank you.